Okay. So, Karen, can you, how did you, you're a textile artist, right? Mm -hmm. How did you get from being New Orleans resident and textile artist to where you are today as a founder and editor at the New Orleans Lund? Well, for, um, of course, my, my catharsis came when we were evacuated for Katrina, 2005. Um, which seems like yesterday and a thousand years ago all at the same time. And when I began to look online for sources of information about what was happening in New Orleans and realized that the national perspective was getting the details wrong in terms of places and um, pronunciations of streets and that I found that um, bloggers, which I had been unaware of until that time, tended to get that excruciating detail correct. And as a New Orleanian, that's what I wanted to know. I wanted to know where the, the photo was taken on what corner at what time. So I began to read blogs and was fascinated with that ability to publish uh, information and have it ac accessible to whomever happened to, to find their way to it. So when I came back in the last day of 2005, um, I started a blog shortly thereafter um, to uh, chronicle houses and demolitions, not really knowing what would unfold later on, but at the beginning it was what I refer to as a memory project, sort of place these places in our minds that we sort of took for granted before and after the storm and evacuation, many of us had a deeper sense of place and a desire to hold on to that. So it was really a change for me. And I uh, remember a professor when I was in school learning weaving would refer to the computer as the first loom. And there were some affinities there in creating a cloth on one side and a back on the other with, that I really enjoyed about, about blogging in general. You could actually make something that was visually satisfying. So you started a website called Squandered Heritage. What were you what were you at the beginning you say it was a memory project but how did it how did it develop after that well i i quickly became um aware of a local preservation um project preservation resource center in town and and they would send out updates on uh, properties to be demolished and i realized that as a community we could interface with um this committee that decided on demolitions but people really didn't know about what was at stake. So I began to publish their agendas. I would photograph all the houses. I put it up online and then alert neighborhoods to impending demolitions in their communities. And uh, that was the first iteration of the project, really, was just inviting people to and educating people to what kind of impact they could have on, on uh, properties that were to be demolished. Um, and then it evolved into um, a larger advocacy tool when the city decided to uh, involuntarily tear people's houses down. That is, the, um, the owners weren't aware that the city was targeting their houses for demolition. And so then we really used, uh, when I say we, it's occasionally someone would help me uh, photograph and work with me, but we, we, there was a very loose group of people who coalesced around this idea of preservation as being an important part of conserving community, not just specific houses because they were aesthetically important, but rather preventing widespread loss in marginal communities by making sure that property owners who had the means would renovate and, re and retain uh, neighbors in the neighborhood. So you were both pushing information you were getting informa gathering information, getting it out to a broader public, and then the public would be more engaged in the process as a result? Is yeah, I mean, it was a surprise to me that um, <coughs> that's this sort of granular level information wasn't available. So you couldn't pick up the newspaper and read the agenda for this community meeting. It wasn't there. In fact, I know during many of the planning processes, some of the frustrations were that the newspaper didn't seem to... Um, recognize the need to inform the public of public meetings. It was a sort of afterthought. Um, 
and I felt strongly that the newspaper did a great job at what it did a good job at, but that on a community level there was a there was a sort of a hole there. And so where did the idea for the lens develop? Well, after um, a few years of working solo at uh, Squandered Heritage, I um, met Ar Ariella Cohen, who was, was a reporter, a, a local business paper, and she uh, and I started working together to create an online news source that in many ways it's, 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 it's evolved since our original um, theory and it's stayed close to our original concept as well. Um, we, we were specifically interested in land use issues, and um, it's become a broader project. But we then um, took part in the um, coalition uh, and saw a lot of those ideas uh, amplified within this, within this coalition we're a part of. And can you talk, so the lens is, you're operating online. And what do you see as you're dealing here with in the in the context of the lens with something that's happening around the country, right? Which is the kind of fading of newspapers and access and the difficulty of getting access to information. But what I hear you saying is that the Times Picayune, even if it, even at its greatest, was not necessarily covering the kinds of issues and getting the information, kinds of information out that people need. Is that? Yeah, I think that you know, there's smaller, smaller, in smaller situations in neighborhoods that may have a profound imp impact on a neighborhood. Yet, uh, it's not reported in the newspaper because the conflicts are are really not broad enough to be as, of citywide interest. But they're definitely neighborhood interest, and, uh, and those things often have larger implications. I've been working on a story for months now about a, a roadway expansion that goes through two different uh, neighborhoods in Orleans Parish, but is really an old uh, project that's being informed with old, inf old community input. And so you won't find the time speaking and doing a piece on this roadway expansion. Uh, they do they will do what I call a press release story about it, mm -hmm. but not really looking at how is the community engaged, how are they informed, and how will this impact the community that lives right next to this project. So I felt like there, was a, there were many opportunities post-storm for the paper to um, lay it on the line, like what's at stake here in terms of community, in terms of repopulation, um, yet they, they didn't. So, what would you, um, how do you think that the lack of transparency and openness is now, sorry, let me rephrase this, um, now we're five years after Katrina, where do you see changes in terms of how do, how do you see the city changed five years later, either for good, for bad, or for both? Well, I, when I first started Squatted Heritage, it was, really, it was really in response to a sort of visceral response uh, to my experience. And then as I traveled with that project a little bit, I saw that there were lots of what I call policy and procedure vacuums. And that was that the city would decide to to enact a policy or a procedure with no, but seldom were there two, the, were there both. Um, so that the, most folks had no understanding of what the city was doing. Um, and if you wanted to understand, it was even more difficult because you just entered in this sort of <coughs> labyrinth of thought and ideas, yet no, there was no sort of dialogue with, with community. And I think the notion of transparency really is a relatively new concept. And so I don't think the concept really existed um, in terms of how a citizen would, would make demands or requests of their uh, governing bodies. And I think that that now has become something which people feel is somewhat of a right, that we deserve to know what decisions are being made on our behalf for the good or for the not um, improvement of our communities. So I think that that, that, that recognition of it is broader. Um, I, 
think it's more acute in New Orleans because people understand what happens when you don't know who's making decisions and what those decisions are. Um, I think so. I think when you when you take a sort of community collective uh, desire, you will have better government. So I, I do see an improvement, not because I think that that, that our political um, issues are wiped away with a change in administration, but I think people's demands are deeper.